reasonable. This is the European History Lecture for um, Thursday, the 10th of December, 2020. This is period one. Now, where we left things was that the Janus-like, Harvey Dent, Two-Face-like French Revolution has the face of the very, very liberal, progressive, uh, idealistic Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, but it also has the dark side of the face of the Paris mob. And not only on the uh, first Bastille Day, 14th July 1789, does this mob make its appearance. It makes its appearance again in 1791 when the fish ladies march on Versailles, capture the king and kill all of his servants and guards, and later that year, uh, when the September massacres are led by the San Culo. In both cases, the Paris mob came together spontaneously and did violence. And everyone in the revolution is aware of this potential for violence that exists in the largest city of the realm, which is now also the capital city once again. However, not everyone is horrified by this. Jean-Paul Marat is thrilled and excited for this. Marat is a doctor who came to Paris to make a living, but it didn't work out. And he ended up doing what a lot of people do in Paris and in video games. When I play uh, any of the Elder Scrolls games, and I'm in a city, uh, and I don't have any money, uh, you know, where do you sleep? Sleep in the sewers, because it's free. Uh, so, Marat, like many people in Paris who didn't have any money, slept in the sewers. However, the thing about the sewers, the thing you really need to understand, is that the sewers are filled with liquid and solid human waste, all sorts of the industrial runoff that they had from tanneries and glue factories, and every disgusting and noisome stench and fluid and solid known to man created by people and by the animals that live around us, including countless numbers of Parisian rats. They are very hoity-toity rats, you know, being from Paris. But, um... Moran develops uh, an incurable skin disease, which basically renders him itchy all over forever. Uh, so, the only relief that he can get is by bathing himself constantly in a warm bath filled with herbs and leaves, tea leaves, or mint leaves. So, how is he going to support himself when all he can do is lie in a tub Aha! The revolution offers him an opportunity. He is going to start a newspaper. L'ami du peuple. L'ami du peuple means the friend of the people, or the people's friend. And Marat is going to be a rollicking success with l'ami du peuple, because, gosh darn it, he understands the problems of revolution. He understands that in a revolution, it's not so much about what you don't do. It's about what you do. Sam? I know. It's the C thing. It's the C name. Uh, it's also because I'm trying to do things, two things at once, and I'm a little tired. Uh, I don't think there's anything here for you guys. I think you went through it pretty thoroughly the other day. So, the problem with the revolution is we have traitors all over the place. Traitors from within. These sneaky little jerks are acting like revolutionaries on the surface. Oh, liberté, égalité, fraternité. They're wearing the tree color. The tree color cockade is the white, red, and blue, or the blue, it's not red, white, and blue, it's blue, white, and red uh, of the French Revolution. Uh, blue and white are the colors of Paris, 
uh, blah, 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 blah. blue and red are the colors of Paris, and white is the color of the Bourbon monarchy. So uh, they look like revolutionaries. They act like revolutionaries. They wear the revolutionary tree color. They're not revolutionaries. They are sneaky, sneaky little treasonous jerks who are undermining the revolution at every opportunity. What we've got to do is we've got to identify these traitors. We got to get rid of them. We got to off them. There is one solution to all the problems we have: heads, heads, and more heads separated from their bodies. So, Marana's newspaper becomes famous for publishing lists of traitors' names and, if possible, what they did. You're smart people. Yeah, enough. Smart enough. What um, what could go wrong in an environment like this, uh, where uh, if if Mara says you're a traitor, uh, you know people are going to come after you? What false accusal of bribery and uh, basically killing people for political gain? Yeah, it makes the Salem witch hunts look like a well-run trial uh, set of trials. Basically, accusation equals conviction. All someone has to do is point you out as a traitor. And the revolutionary authorities are probably going to come for you. You'll have a show trial, a people's court, and not the people's court that you see on TV, a people's court that is revolutionary justice, which means that if you're not finding enough guilty people, you're just not working hard enough. And then there is the inevitable answer, which is you get introduced to Monsieur Guillotin's new invention. So, Marat is stoking the fires of mob violence. He is stoking the fires of revolution. He is publishing ever-increasing numbers of names, lists, and secret plots that people are revealing to him. They are unveiling to him. As a result of this, Marat is uh, the hero of the mob. He is the patron saint of the crowd. Well, not all of France is loving what Paris is doing. And in Normandy, there is a woman named Charlotte Corday who's looking on with horror. So she decides she's going to do something about it. She goes to Paris. She goes to Marat's uh, publishing house where Marat stays. And Marat has an open-door policy. Literally, doors are open. Anyone who wants to can come in and tell him information. And if he likes it, he'll publish it. So she gets in line, and she sees him. She goes up to him. Marat's in his tub, of course. She takes out a stiletto and stabs him to death. She doesn't flee. She allows herself to be arrested. And on, in her trial, she says, with Marad dead, our, my country can return to normal. My country can return to sanity. She means that her country can return to a time when accusation didn't mean a death penalty, where mob violence didn't run everything. Well, she was executed with the guillotine. Um, but what they did was... They turned Marat into the martyr, the Jesus Christ of the revolution. There's a famous painting by Jacques-Louis David, the great uh, painter of the revolution and of the neoclassical period. And it shows Marat reclining in his tub with his arm draped and his head to the side in precisely the pose of Jesus in a pieta. If you'll remember the pietas of Michelangelo, the statues, the subject matter is uh, Mary, mother of Christ, holding her dead son just after he's been taken from the cross. And there is a classic pose where the body of Christ is draped and his mother is sort of holding him from under one of his arms as best she can. Well, that is the pose of Marat. Instead of Mary, it is Marat's famous bathtub. Marat's funeral is held in a cathedral where they rip out the altar and replace it with Marat's tub. 
they take the names of streets and rename them from Rue de Saint Germain, uh, the, the road of Saint Germain, to Rue de Marat, the road of Marat. Because Marat and others, but particularly Marat, he died for the people that he loved. The friend of the people has been silenced. Will the people let his mission go undone? No. Unfortunately, Charlotte Corday's assassination does not bring her country back to normal. It intensifies revolutionary zeal, revolutionary accusation, revolutionary violence. There is another region of France in the northwest, just south of Brittany, called the Vendée. The Vendée is an, a country area of forested hills and mountains. And the people there are loyal to their church and to their local nobles. The Vendée withdraws from the French Republic, from revolutionary France, and tries to have their own independent nation. From 1793 through 1799, for six bloody years, every Republican army that marches into the Vendée is slaughtered. The Vendeans maintain their a region and their area. When Republicans uh, march in, they surround them, they kill them, they ambush them, they misdirect them, they frustrate them. They fight a very successful war, both conventional and guerrilla. In other words, an army where army uh, a war where armies fight one another that's conventional, and a war where people dressed and acting like civilians suddenly come forward and attack and then melt back into the civil population. In the Vendée, they have both. It is extraordinarily effective, according to the people who run the French Republic. This is their biggest problem. It's a bigger problem than fighting England or fighting the Germans, conquering Holland trying to conquer Switzerland or Italy, or anything else. Because the Vendeans are French, and it is a popular movement. It's not the aristocrats and priests of the Vendée leading an unwilling or passive population. The people of the countryside in the Vendée hate the revolution. They hate what's being done. And by no means are they the only provincials that hate the revolution and hate what's being done. The revolution is the creature of the city of Paris more than anything else. And Paris has so many people that when they send out revolutionary militia to run things in the countryside, usually they get their way. But they get their way because the local people are afraid, not because they necessarily are loyal to the ideals of the Parisian revolution. There's a reason why the cockade has the colors of Paris and the colors of the Bourbon monarchy. If the Vendée was allowed to succeed, it would spread. The revolution against the revolution, the counter-revolution, would spread. And uh, the uh, French Republican leaders do not want that at all. So the Vendée is going to be a running sore, a wound that does not scab over, a wound that does not uh, stop bleeding, a wound that does not heal for six long, bloody years. Finally, when the armies of the Republic uh, managed to overwhelm the Vendée with their numbers and their resources, what they do to end the war for once and all is illustrative. They get all of the key Vendéan prisoners and they crowd them into three river barges, which they're gonna use as prisons. They tow those river barge barges out to the middle of the river, and they fire cannon at them until they all sink. Anyone who manages to swim clear of the wreck gets shot from either shore. They kill them all. The Republic and the Vendée do not have mercy between one another and do not have quarter, and the war ends with the mass slaughter of the Vendée and rebel soldiers. Now... The leaders of the revolution are by no means monolithic. One of the first great divisions happens over the question of whether or not to execute the king. Those people who do not want to execute the king, who want to continue to try to work with him and have a constitutional monarchy like they had in Britain, gather at the Gironde Club, and they are called the Girondins. 
the Girondin oppose the execution of the king. And they are ultimately deemed traitors by the Jacobins. The Jacobins are for the execution of the king. And they gather at the Jacobin Salon, the Jacobin Club. And the Jacobins become the real leaders of the revolution. Robespierre famously says, with the king alive, there's always the hope uh, in our enemies that we can return to normal, like Corday said. But with the king dead, we'll never go back. And that's what he wanted. The two great leaders of the Jacobin faction are Georges Danton and uh, Maximilian Robespierre. Georges Danton, or George Danton, uh, Georges Danton is a big, beefy, popular guy who is great at making speeches, and he is a man of the people. He goes out and he drinks, and he wenches, which is he, he sleeps with the ladies, and he is seen as a big, red-faced man who loves life. He's an intellectual, but he doesn't act like one. And he's the one that saves the revolution when the uh, Duke of Brunswick's army is getting close. It is Danton's uh, ra rousing speech that boldness, boldness, and more boldness, and the fatherland will be saved, and the revolution will be saved. And it's his armies that stand up at the Battle of Valmy and don't retreat. So Danton is not afraid to use violence. He says famously that revolutions are not made with rose water. Rosewater is a form of cologne or perfume. Ro revolutions are made with blood. You've got to be willing to have blood. Robespierre is his polar opposite. Robespierre is a petite man. Everything perfectly in order. Immaculate. Always in these stylish suits. A famous tailor made Robespierre a suit with every button having a guillotine on it. It was his favorite suit. He loved it. Robespierre was a lawyer, bespeckled, wore glasses, little guy, not a dwarf, just very petite man. And his approach was not warm and emotional like Danton's. His approach to everything is cold and precise. Danton is sort of like a barroom brawler. Robespierre is like a surgeon. He just cuts. Cuts what he needs to cut. Without any feeling, he just does it. Robespierre is famously called the incorruptible. Because the people in the revolutionary leadership and in the country at large begin to see him as the only man who will not compromise on principle. He believes that the revolution needs to be protected in every way, and that is his guiding star. Famously, Robespierre says that terror and virtue are the chief qualities of a revolution. Terror and virtue. You need virtue, which is uh, bringing out the best in people. You need to try to be good. You need to try to be pure. You need to try not, be, not to be corrupt, never to take, always to serve, always to give. But you also need terror. He famously says that terror without virtue is murderous. You're just being violent. You're flailing around. You're, 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 you're killing and wounding and maiming and crippling people randomly just to scare them, just to show them that you're a mad dog killer and nobody had better mess with you. That's not what we need. Terror without virtue is murderous. But virtue without terror is useless. Robespierre absolutely understands that it is the application of force designed to induce in people an absolute fear of being caught out in a counter-revolutionary thought, word, or deed. That that terror can actually change people's minds that that terror can break the old pattern and make a new pattern, break the old French monarchical man and make a new French revolutionary man.
That's the kind of man Robespierre is. And to my mind, he's one of the scariest individuals that ever led a country. Now, one of the hallmarks of the revolution is the idea that we're going to do things new and improved. New and improved, like it's one word. New and improved. And there is a new machine that's going to make execution beautifully, painlessly, modernly, efficiently done. You see, in the old days, if you were not an aristocrat, you got killed by being hanged from the neck until dead, or in various other nasty ways. Only noblemen were offered the chance of getting their head cut off by a, hang by a headsman, by an axeman. The problem is, somewhere in the world in those days, there was a headsman, or an axeman, or an executioner, that was having a cold or having a bad day. And if he slipped up, you wouldn't die quick and painless. You would die slow by being hacked at. Nobody wanted that. Monsieur Guillotin invents a rack-like machine. It's about 50 feet tall. At the bottom of the rack is the center part of the stocks. Remember the stocks from the Puritan times? You put your head and arms through the stocks and you're, you're there and everyone can throw fruit at you and kick you and spit at you. Well, this has the head thing at the stocks and you're supposed to put your arms sort of out and around. So your head goes in and the part of the stocks above comes down. You can't move your head, you're stuck. You're also laying down on a... Um, on a... Uh, on a tabletop, basically, that they slide forward. So they strap you down. Maybe they tie you down. Maybe they don't. Uh, and uh, they make sure your hair is cut so that you don't have any hair going over the back of your neck because that might foul the blade. Then they roll you forward, open up the stocks. Your head goes in. They close the stocks. There you are, laying down on a mobile tabletop uh, with your head through the stocks. What you can't really look up and see very well above you, 50 feet up, is a heavy wooden bar, and under that bar is a blade cut on the bias, a blade with an, an angular blade that's as sharp as a razor. In fact, Monsieur Guillotin's invention is called the National Razor. When the uh, weight is released, you've got a heavy block coming down on you, but the block's not what's going to hit you. What's going to hit you is that angled blade about this wide, slicing on the bias with a razor sharp tip, sharp tip. You're dead before you know it. Your head is flying through the air into a basket, uh, and your body is probably still going to be making noise. And there are reports of people trying to move their lips, trying to talk, and trying to do things mm, 10, 20, 30 seconds after they were executed, because they're dead, but they just haven't figured it out yet. Their nervous system hasn't caught up. Everyone gets killed like a nobleman. Everyone gets killed quick and fast and efficient, and it's bright and shiny new scientific. This is the ultimate expression of the French Revolution, the guillotine. And the guillotines are gonna, of France are going to get used, a lot of use, over the next few years during what will be called the Terror and the Great Terror. Now... Jacques-Marie uh, Hebert is another Jacobin leader. And Jacques-Marie Hebert has a notion. His notion is that the old France was based on an alliance between the French monarchy and the Pope. And the French people are steeped in their Christianity. Remember, we were losing the war, Hebert said, to the English in the Hundred Years' War, until a little 14-year-old girl comes around saying that the Virgin Mary whispers in her ear. It was St. Joan of Arc that won, uh, that, that brought the French spirit back and helped us win the Hundred Years' War against the English. The French people are deeply and reflexively Christian. If we're going to have a real revolution, we got to get rid of that. we got to attack Christianity. we got to attack the faith <clears throat> in little ways and in big ways. We've got to break the hold of the Christian faith on the French people. If we do that, then we can win. If we don't do that, we will never win. So Jacques-Marie Hebert is put in charge of the de-Christianization campaign. One aspect of that campaign is that time itself 
will be measured differently. Above the picture of the Leviathan in your notes is a calendar. A calendar. It's sideways. And this calendar is a new thing. First off, the seven-day week is scrapped. We are now going to have 10-day weeks, three of them per month. We're going to have a few extra days thrown in to deal with the difference between the lunar and solar calendars. But we're going to have three 10-day weeks per month. And we're getting rid of the old names. It's going to be the first day, the second day, and the third day, and so on. We're also going to have new months. Let's see how many months are in this calendar. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 months, plus a holiday period, to, again, to match up uh, the solar and lunar calendars to some extent. But these are months are going to be given new names, like Floreal, which is roughly analogous to April and May, and Thermidor, which is the hot time of July and August. The point of this isn't so much to rationalize time. Oh, and the year. The revolution, uh, the execution of the king, this is the beginning of the new era. So it's the year one. It'll be the year two and three and so on. So that Anno Domini dating system is gone. That seven-day week referenced in Genesis is gone. Why? Because you don't want people to remember Sundays. You don't want people to remember Easter. You don't want them to remember Christian, Christmas or any of the other holidays. You don't want them to have the patterns of their own lives. Their old lives are gone. The old France is gone. We are now rationalized. Ten-day weeks, new named months named after flowers and heat, and uh, no more Sundays. No more church services. No more names of streets for saints. No more saints for hospitals. No more churches. We're going to get rid of it all. We're going to turn churches into meeting houses or stables or factories or something useful. We are going to destroy the idea of Christianity in the minds of people. And one way of doing that is to change how people address one another. A little thing like that. To the point where Hebert's policies lead to saying, Bonjour, monsieur. Bonsoir, madame. Good day, mister. Good evening, ma'am. Is a death penalty offense. No, no, no. You don't call people monsieur or madame. First of all, that's sexist. Second of all, that's unrevolutionary. We are all citizens. Citizen, citizen, citizen. No distinction. Citoyen. Bonjour, citoyen. Bonsoir, citoyen. You're allowed to say that. You have to say that. If you don't say that, you'll be punished. Maybe even killed. Now, do you understand how jumped up with tension people need to be to stop themselves from saying, good morning, mister, accidentally? But they do, because they know people who have been taken by the Revolutionary Guards and beaten to a bloody pulp or executed for wrong think, for thinking in the old way. No, 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 we're in a new era. We measure time differently. We no longer have a king. We no longer have the church. We are under the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which have been suspended for the duration of the emergency. <laughs> this, you know, look, Robespierre starts out as, a, as an opponent of the death penalty. But when the revolutionaries are in charge, the death penalty isn't about supporting some king. It's about protecting the people. And if you're not willing to kill folk to protect the people, you're not a real revolutionary. See how things change. Finally, Robespierre gets on board with the dechristianization thing to an extent. He didn't really think it was possible to separate people from their beliefs. He didn't think it was possible to establish in France a genuine official atheism. But he got on board with getting rid of Christ and getting rid of that whole thing. 
So Robespierre proclaims a great holiday. And everyone in Paris is invited to come to this open area where construction has been working for the last week or so. Well, what they built is a paper mache mountain, because it's Paris. They use plaster of Paris, paper mache, get it. Uh, and you have this paper mache mountain, and out of a fake cave door comes Robespierre, togate, in a Roman toga. And he looks up and unveils a statue that's remarkably similar to what will become our Statue of Liberty. The statue is the goddess of reason. The people of Paris are like, does he expect us to worship that? Is, is he acting like a high priest? What the hell is going on? But he goes through with it. He initiates a ritual for the people of Paris to show gratitude to the goddess of reason. That was him jumping the shark, which is an expression that goes back to 1970s television. In the early 1970s, there were three networks, and vast parts of the nation watched TV on one of those three networks. So you could be reasonably certain if there was a popular television show that most everyone <coughs> in your world uh, would uh, watch. And one of the most popular shows of that era was a show harkening back to the good old days of the 1950s called Happy Days. And on that show, there was a character who was the apotheosis of cool, whose name was Fonzie. He wore a leather jacket, he had a white hat, he had cigarettes under his shoulder, for uh, under his uh, sleeves for a while, and then smoking became bad. Um, so he was the epitome of cool for a vast chunk of the American people, and Happy Days was a ritual that people did every week. They watched for a half hour, they laughed, and they talked about it the next day at school or at work. Well, the intense popularity of anything like this is going to wear off after a while. But to prevent this, the show was trying to become more edgy and more extreme and push the envelope. So they changed a few characters, and finally, they had... Fonzie, this apotheosis of cool, get on water skis. And he was pulled along with water skis and swim trunks and his signature leather jacket, of course, because he's not Fonzie without the leather jacket. And the boat pulls him past a shark tank and he jumps over, uh, there's a ramp, and he goes up with water skis and he jumps the shark. And that is the moment where most people who remember these things or who research them say that happy days died. It was going one step too far into the ridiculous. How does a cool 50s biker guy uh, gain face by water skiing over a shark in a leather jacket? It, just, it was stupid. And it was the end of happy days as a genuinely popular thing. So, Robespierre sort of jumps the shark with his goddess of reason. Yeah. I do find it quite ironic that he's... the amount of reason that you would have to lack in order to make that an actual thing. Well, his idea was this. Robespierre argued that Hebert is wrong. Robespierre does not think that the average person can be an atheist. They'd go crazy. They'd kill themselves. Life without God is pretty darn hopeless. You know, you live for a while and then you die. Um, it's not a very appealing way to live. And Robespierre understands further that most Frenchmen are not intellectuals. He's an intellectual. He thinks he can live in a world where God is, you know, maybe a creator without... He, or maybe, it's, maybe, it's, maybe there is no God. But he's an intellectual. But the common people who he purports to serve are a bunch of superstitious, ignorant rubes. And they need to believe in something. He doesn't want them to believe in the old church. He and Hebert agree on that. But he doesn't believe that they can be without religion. So what he's trying to do is create a religion that suits the revolution, a revolutionary religion. And he believes that because people have a need to believe in something, they'll buy it. Yeah, you're right. The goddess of reason is rather unreasonable. But it's easy to say now because you're not there in the 
in the moment with Robespierre and all the excitement. Things get more intense. And Robespierre convinces uh, the National Assembly, by any other name, to institute the terror. The terror is going to cleanse society and purge it of all its enemies. We don't have Marat anymore, but the terror is going to make France a genuinely revolutionary place in thought, in word, in deed. The National Assembly gives over power to an executive committee called, oh, you're going to love this, the Committee of Public Safety. Talk about euphemisms. I hate euphemisms. You will learn how much I hate euphemisms when we start talking about the Nazis and the final solution to the Jewish question. Sounds like a geometry program. No, it's the genocide of an entire race of people. Uh, the Committee of Public Safety. They run the terror. They come up with the death lists. They make sure the guillotines run effectively. They look into everyone's lives. And Robespierre, the incorruptible, runs the Committee of Public Safety. So, the terror intensifies, and you start having several people executed every week, regular. This is the, uh, like the Aztec human sacrifices to keep time going. This shows the people that revolutionary justice is there. And this is also done. Guillotines are set up in every town square around France. And the local militia <clears throat> are tasked with finding traitors and feeding the guillotine in increasingly uh, increasing numbers. And then the Great Terror, where you now have not a few or a dozen people a week, but several dozen people, even a hundred or more people, every week. What is he guilty of? He said, Monsieur, what is he guilty of? Uh, he, he didn't cheer uh, vigorously enough during our revolutionary speech. Uh, what did he say? Uh, he made a joke about Robespierre and his guillotine buttons. Anything could be caused to be put on a death list and the government would execute. The Great Terror was not a reasonable response to actual counter-revolution. It was a designed psychological weapon. Robespierre wanted to break down. In basic training in the military, there's a reason why everyone gets their hair cut short, and up until now anyway, why it was a really harsh experience you know, the NCOs, the drill sergeants would team up on you in a shark attack. And there's nothing you could do right. And basically for weeks, you don't get enough sleep. You're working your butt off. You are constantly being criticized. Everything that you do is wrong. It's designed to break you down. The individual that walked in, a civilian, is going to be destroyed. And his place is going to be built a soldier, a sailor, an airman, a marine, or a coasting. Now, it'll still be you. But it'll be you with discipline. It'll be you with toughness, mental and physical. It'll be you capable of walking into combat because you've been through training. And training in its own way is a preparation for combat. That's why it's so harsh. Robespierre wants to do that to the entire French nation. To break down the old people. The, the old ways of thinking. The ideas of, of Christian mercy and of good manners and of aristocracy and of the pre and all, all just everything and get everyone so traumatized that the old person in them dies and then a new person can be rebuilt in their place programmed by the revolution by the way every social revolution since the french revolution follows this pattern of terror and great terror of breaking down the old personality and trying to rebuild a new person the russians in the cold war called it the new soviet man they wanted to build new Soviet men, people without greed. So, um, the Committee of Public Safety turns up the heat, and now we are in the month of Thermidor, year two. Robespierre is on top of the world, people are dying. Even Georges Danton, who saved the revolution, is accused of not being fervent enough in his zeal. And if Danton can be killed, anyone can be killed. And Robespierre does this. Danton's famous last words are, the only regret I have is that I'm going before that rat Robespierre. One day, 
Robespierre walks into the Committee of Public Safety. The people who are talking are quiet. And he says, you won't believe what I've found. I have a list of revolutionaries at the top levels who are really traitors to the Republic. This list is going to blow you away. It's going to knock your socks off. And of course, people look up because they, you know, we're at the top of revolution. Who, who's on the list? You know what? I'll tell you tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm not going to tell you. Slam. And he leaves. I don't know why a person would do that in a regime that's killing people by the thousands. But he does. What do you think the Committee of Public Safety did the moment Robespierre left? Yeah? Plot to kill him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, he's going to die. He's got to die right now, because what he's just implied is that several people on this committee are on this list. He has implied that he's going to kill us. Now, I don't think Robespierre thought this one through. I thought that he was, I think he was power drunk, and he got lazy, and he just, he was trying to build theatrical tension or something. I'm not going to tell you, slam. Oh, no. They, they ordered his arrest immediately. He was arrested that afternoon. That night, somebody smuggled him a pistol, and he tried shooting his head off. He ended up blowing his jaw off. So the man who killed more people with his mouth, with his words and speeches, than anyone in the French Revolution couldn't speak in his last few hours. He had this shattered jaw, and he was you know, bleeding and bandaged, and it was agony. And then they take him out to the guillotine, and they cut his hair off before they do, and, uh, and Robespierre is killed. Wouldn't you know it? The terror ends. The Committee of Public Safety steps back. And a new, more conservative, less revolutionary government is set up. It's called the Directory. The Directory. The Directory. All of my communist would-be revolutionary college professors loved Robespierre. And they hated the Directory as a bunch of, you know, conventional middle-class revolutionaries, traitors to the actual ongoing revolution. Because my brilliant and well-intentioned college professors loved the terror. They believed that Robespierre could, by government power, shatter the old human nature and replace it with a better, improved human nature. I don't know why. I honestly do not know why. Theoretical intellectuals are credulous towards this stuff. It boggles my mind that somebody with several PhDs after their name, who is brilliant theoretically, can actually think that you can take the power of policing and punishing people, reach into the minds of everyone in your country, and flip switches until they come out just the way you want. You're programmed robots and drones. But they believe it. And every single social revolution tries this. They absolutely do. And if you don't think that the politically correct cancel culture movement is about that here in this country, think about it. Think about it. Oh, you're afraid to say anything because you might offend someone. You're afraid to say anything because somebody might call you a racist or a sexist or a homophobe or a misogynist. You can't say Merry Christmas because you might offend an atheist or a Muslim. You can't be free to speak. You can't be free to express yourself. You can't be free to support a political point of view that isn't the popular one among the lefties. Otherwise, the Twitter mob will come after you. If you're an adult, they'll come after your job. They'll come after your uh, friends. They'll come after your family. They'll come after anyone who would defend you so that you end up being isolated and alone and punished. Why? Because you are guilty of wrong things. That sort of nonsense happens now. And if you're going to college, get ready for it. Because they will try it on you. I've been a teacher a long time. And I can tell you one of the worst parts of my job is since I am preparing people for college, I know how college has changed. I know what college is. Most colleges betray their educational role. They betray the trust of families and students. Instead of teaching people how to think, they teach them what to think, and they punish anyone who doesn't think like they do. Not only can you go into a history class and get a failing grade because you don't agree with the professor's point of view, 
but you can end up getting mobbed by other students while the professor looks on and smiles. I'm not joking. These things happen. They've happened to people I know. This sort of revolutionary reprogramming comes from the Jacobins and comes from Robespierre and is perfected by Karl Marx. But according, <clears throat> according to a lot of the, uh, the historians and students of the French Revolution, the real revolutionary radical phase ends with Thermidor, year two, which is also seven, July 1795, and a new stage is set, a stage that's going to uh, be occupied by a dictator, Napoleon Bonaparte. The French Revolution is Julius Caesar, only different and worse. Uh, and that will be for a future lesson. Also, I would expect there to be a major exam towards the middle to the end of next week uh, on Unit 2. We'll be done by then. Thank you for your attention and for you at home, and uh, have a good day.